my name is Tanish and I work at SUSE as a container engineer. engineer. In this session, we'll be talking about node control and container D as an alternative to Docker and Podman. The agenda is going to look like the following. We'll first talk about container engine and the container runtime evolution. We'll talk about different container engines, runtimes, and their history, a um, little bit about their motivation. And um, then we'll move on to introducing container D and node control. Then we'll also throw into the mix Run C and Docker here because they are um, essentially most relevant to the topics being discussed here. Um, then we'll do a short comparison between the different tools, which is uh, node control, container D, Podman, Docker, and even Run C. We then discuss uh, a couple of advanced yet experimental features that are part of node control currently. And uh, we'll also see a small demo with some of the features there. Um, we'll close the session with a, uh, with, uh, with a small slide on uh, how you can get started with container D or not control, and then we'll do a wrap up. So container runtime and the container engine evolution. Before I go ahead with the slide, uh, just a small disclaimer um, that this slide deliberately excludes some of the technology that came before um, Docker, uh, even in between the timeline shown in the slide here. And uh, that's deliberate. But uh, the fact is uh, that it's done in order to maintain the brevity and the relevance for the slide. Um, so you will not see Solaris containers or free PSD jails or LXC here. Now, with that out of the way, we'll start off with Docker. I think uh, the idea with Docker when it started in 2013 was to simplify the distribution of applications using containers. And at this point, I think we can safely say that Docker uh, essentially promulgated the widespread adoption of containers. And then uh, container use essentially exploded after uh, the launch of Docker. And then uh, shortly after that, a couple of years later, Docker introduced something called Run C. Uh, they tried to open source their low level plumbing interface in the form of Run C. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, what Run C is, what does it do in, in the later uh, slides. But uh, the idea behind open sourcing Run C, open sourcing Run C was uh, essentially to perhaps give back to the community and also to make Docker's own source code a bit more modularized. Um, in a sense that now Docker and Run C and maybe perhaps other tools can uh, see their development run in parallel, and then this would again benefit both Docker and the community. Um, in the same vein, Docker again open sourced uh, another utility, uh, which uh, is called Containerd. And uh, apart from the goals that Docker had with Run C, the the primary goal with Containerd was to facilitate uh, experiments uh, with advanced features that would eventually pave the way back into Docker. So the idea is to uh, play around with advanced feature in Containerd, and then once they, they've been battle tested on Containerd, uh, bake them back into Docker. And uh, in late 2017, Red Hat comes out with uh, Podman. Uh, it's an alternative container engine, which um, the primary aim of which is to address some of Docker's limitation, that is um, not running a rootful daemon or allowing users to run rootless containers, et cetera. And then in late 2020, folks uh, behind Containerd introduced uh, node control with a similar aim in mind as when Containerd was introduced. And the idea is uh, to, again, facilitate even more cutting edge experiments or advanced features in node control, which would then be promulgated across the containerized domain. For example, it could see their way back into Docker or even Podman as we see with some of the features um, currently. So with that, let's talk a little bit about uh, Containerd. So Containerd is a high level run container runtime. Uh, why do we call it high level? We call it high level because there is a low level container runtime that sits below Containerd and uh, that is Run C. So Containerd was initially um, introduced as a daemon to manage Run C. And Run C is the one that deals with the Linux kernel and then um, leverages several Linux features to run containers. Some of the features for Containerd 
our uh, container image management uh, that is pulling images and packing them into snapshots etc uh, network management container supervision in the form of communicating with the lower level component which is run c in this case to run create stop delete start containers and then also it handles uh, metadata for the various objects involved in the container space which is your snapshots images and then volumes um on the right hand side you can see the chain of command uh, between containerd and runc so containerd is the one communicating um in sort of like a downward api to runc uh, which further talks to the linux kernel let's see history uh, when it comes to containerd let's uh, talk about some of the historical aspects of uh, the introduction of to, to the introduction of containerd it was as we said earlier it was initially developed by docker and then open sourced and the uh, idea was i think as we saw before uh, it was designed as a daemon to manage runc and uh, to pave the way for advanced functionality and these functionality could include checkpoint restore uh, seccom user name spaces and then eventually um, open the door for such features back into docker now we talked about uh, how containerd is a high level container on time and then it talks to a low level container on time which is runc and uh, the other reason it is called a container runtime and not a container engine is because it sits underneath container engines or uh, larger embedded systems and uh, in on the on the right hand side you can see containerd is very commonly used with kubernetes and docker and other tools and uh, there is a very high chance that you have used containerd but perhaps not just directly as of yet so with these goals it was never meant to be used directly by developers or end users and uh, this went on for a long while until um, there was a proper cli in the form of node control which we'll talk about next um but but the thing is uh, over the time containerd grew from a simple daemon which was managing runc uh, which used to be part of docker to a full blown runtime um and then at this point in time uh, there is a lot of overlapping features between uh, between between docker and containerd and then they are now following their own development paths but in no way containerd competes with docker in that sense it just so happens that there is now a, um th there are no, now more choices to the community uh, when they come out with uh, requirements in order to use a container at time so they they can use either docker they can use containerd depending on their requirements um also yes i think uh, one of the goals that i missed here was the fact that development of docker saw a lot of learnings and then uh, the team behind containerd uh, used those those learnings uh, to create a cleaner interface and api and then this is why i think you'll see a lot of discussion about plugins when it comes to containerd it's very easy here it's very easy to uh, build plugins for containerd and then uh, that is because the kind of interface they've developed so far and that was directly uh, coming from learnings from developing docker over the years uh, so we've been talking about runc uh, for a while i think uh, it's fair that we um, give some uh, screen time to runc also so runc is a lightweight portable container runtime and we already know it's a low level container runtime which um handles api calls from containerd like containerd communicates with uh, runc in order to manage the container life cycle these low level container runtimes are also referred to sometimes as runtime ship shims and um, so and, and these are the low level components that are dealing with the linux kernel as we saw before um this is why runc is actually what owns the container processes and then uh, runc is the one interacting with the linux kernel and leveraging features uh, that make up uh, containers in linux so these features such as contain control groups namespaces capabilities app armor and more and uh, other examples i think uh, runc is just one of the examples for a lower level container runtime other examples include crun from red hat firecracker from aws and gvisa from google so this is in a nutshell of how um, and what runc does and how it behaves uh, the the diagram again shows the chain of command or the communication um, direction from runc to the linux kernel and then it operates um leveraging some of the features available in the kernel as we saw um 
let's talk about nerd control now so nerd control uh, was started off as a docker compatible cli for continuity and as we saw before continuity was not meant to be used directly by developers it uh, was supposed to be embedded into larger system but as continuity morphed into a full blown runtime it made all the more sense uh, for the team to have a cli with two primary goals in mind so one of the goals was to 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 make it easy for new users to adapt node control and continuity and the uh, the way to do that was to make node con node control docker compatible so the cli that you use uh, with docker uh, there is a one to one almost a one to one mapping with node control so that it is easier for you to um, migrate if you so happen to to node control and continuity uh, coming from docker uh, but again in no way it aims to compete with docker that's not the uh, not the primary goal here and again similar to continuity uh, i think uh, as, as we've mentioned before nerd control nerd control was developed to facilitate experimental features in uh, continuity and then similar to continuity and how docker uh, communicated um, in, in one of the first slides that advanced features in continuity continuity would make it back to docker the idea here is very similar that we'll experiment some of the advanced experimental features in our control and then they will uh, be ported over to docker and even portman to some extent and some of these features include lazy image pulling um which is to say that uh, not waiting for the entire image being pulled and then just running containers um debugging docker files in an interactive shell and um peer to peer container image distribution and also container image signing using cosign or not when we'll talk about some of these features um uh, later on and then we'll also see demos for some of these features uh let's talk about docker uh, very very briefly so as we as we as we talked before docker is responsible for widespread container adoption and uh, it it is a container engine by heart because um it is it is dealing with or it is communicating with low and low and high level container runtimes for example containerd and uh, by extension runc so container um, so docker is not really a container runtime anymore maybe it used to be at one point in time uh, but not anymore and uh, it provides a high level cli uh, i think uh, most of us have used docker and then we are accustomed to the kind of cli it provides and that cli has made its way into many other tools uh, nowadays for example podman is now docker compatible or at least aiming to be docker compatible uh, on the right hand side you can see a simplified uh, a rather simplified architecture for docker so you have components such as docker client which is your docker cli most of the times and you have docker compose talking to a daemon which is uh, docker d this daemon would in turn talk to containerd and then containerd would uh, communicate with runc and then runc would communicate with the linux kernel and this is how the whole uh, flow looks like when you issue a command such as docker run minus it alpine uh, echo hello um, so how does all of this work together we have certain high level components um we've seen docker we've we know about kubernetes we've talked briefly about node control and uh, we 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 know podman as container engine as well so these are the tools um some of these tools actually directly communicate with containerd again we've seen this together but we've seen this before but now we're putting this together and then uh, as we know containerd is embedded into docker into kts and node control on the other hand communicates with containerd and uh, containerd then talks to runc and in this case podman also directly talks to runc so despite being a, a container engine docker uh, podman also serves as a container or a high level container at run time and then it talks to runc um to serve its container management life cycle needs and then finally runc talks to uh, to the kernel and this is how if if you have to compare at a glance how and where let's say docker and containerd stands or containerd and podman stands or for example runc and node control stands which is not a appropriate comparison but i think this diagram helps uh, us under, understand how things are working together how 
different components are at different layers in the in the whole chain of command. Uh, a short segue, um, because there seems to be a little bit of confusion with a bunch of tools. Um, for example, CTL, CryCTL, NerdCTL. Um, CTL is essentially, as we as we have talked before, continuity was never meant to be used by users. Um, so, but it still needed a certain utility for the developers working on continuity to communicate with it, maybe debug it or test it or uh, uh, look at the logs or whatever, right? So that was uh, what the uh, original idea with CTL was. It was a debugging utility rather than an uh, end user command line interface for continuity. And then we have CryCTL, which is a CLI utility for Kubernetes Kubelet CLI, which is a container time interface. I think uh, it's in the news these days a lot, but um, it is again very different from uh, CTL in the sense that it deals with the Kubelet CLI, which is to say that um, doc, uh, sorry, uh, Kubernetes basically earlier had a Docker shim and uh, Docker was the sole container runtime that uh, Kubernetes used to use. And then over time, as the advent of new container runtime started happening, uh, Kubernetes created a new um, runtime interface and then uh, container runtimes can implement that API, uh, which is provided with the runtime interface and then they can plug into Kubernetes. Uh, so CryCTL is used for that purpose. And then node control, as we all know, it's a Docker compatible end user CLI for um, continuity. So just to clear out a little bit of confusion here, we'll move on and then we'll see how um, a couple of the tools that we've already talked about compare with each other. So we'll talk about um, four primary um, features and these are the four columns shown in the table here and then the three container engines slash runtime on the left hand side, which are the rows. So Podman, so let's talk about rootless. Podman is the only container engine uh, which had rootless as one of the initial goals. And uh, although Containerd and Node Control started supporting uh, rootless, it was very much later into the development cycle of these tools because it was never a design goal, so to say. Um, then container lifecycle is essentially, since it's been taken care of by the lower level components, uh, this is more or less uh, exactly the same in all three of these. And then we come to image management, in which case um, node control uh, provides image encryption along with the standard operations. And then uh, Portman also does the same. Uh, then we talk about network management. Uh, here things are more or less similar because uh, uh, Almost all of them use uh, this library called Slurp for, for NetNS in order to provide rootless networking, but uh, NerdCTL recently came out with a bypass for NetNS, which improves the performance of rootlet, rootless networking uh, provided by Slurp for NetNS uh, by, by manifolds. And we'll see how uh, improved this is in the later sections uh, of the session. Um, now I think we can talk about uh, some of the features of node control and uh, see some of the demos. So the primary or, or one of the very fancy features that I really like is um, lazy image pulling. So one of the studies done by some of the folks at University of Wisconsin, they analyzed and benchmarked about 60 container workloads and they found that pulling packages account for roughly 80% of the container start time, but only 6.5 6.4% of the data is read um, at runtime. And uh, this is essentially the Pareto principle, but it's working in reverse here. And the, the idea out of this is the fact that pulling takes the majority of time when running a container afresh from uh, the start because um, you, you're not using a lot of files that are part of the container image. And uh, in this case, uh, what node control provides is lazy image pulling, which is to say that we are pulling the com we, we are not pulling the complete image, but we're only pulling selected data, which helps us start the container before even the image pull is completed. And uh, this sounds fancy, um, but we'll quickly take a look at some of the benchmarks provided on the node control GitHub repository. So as you can see. Um, the traditional way of doing things, which is legacy, is usually takes a lot, lot longer. And then uh, the star GZ, which is um, 
a snapshot or, or a file system snapshotter for node control is uh, considerably faster when it comes to pulling images and uh, running them. But uh, if you notice closely, the time it takes for the container to run is slightly increased in uh, star GC without optimization. So there are two versions of star GC, which is with optimization, without optimization. With optimization here basically means that while converting an image to a star GC uh, version, the, some benchmarking is done and then uh, we see what kind of files the container needs at which point, and then we occasionally and accordingly cache those files beforehand. So we're not uh, fetching certain files at runtime from the network. And then uh, without is basically, again, uh, we're not doing any caching. So in this case, the run might take a little bit of more time because we're fetching fresh files from the network. Um, so let's quickly see a demo right now. So I have um, the StarGZ snapshot running on my machine. And then here I'm just simply doing a comparison between a traditional pull and uh, um, star GZ snapshot of pull. And uh, we are going to pull a Python 3 image and see how they fare out. So while this goes on, I think uh, StarGZ is just one of the snapshotters, uh, one of the snapshot plugins. There are other file systems that are available. For example, Nidos overlay PD that you can take a look into. And then I think we can see here that um, StarGZ, I think lazy pulling is already done. And then it took uh, roughly 23 seconds. Whereas the legacy way of pulling images took roughly around 40 seconds. So I think it, it depends on uh, a lot of factors, how you're optimizing the images, what kind of workloads you have, but it definitely uh, is considerably faster than uh, legacy image pulling. Uh, let's come back and uh, we can now talk about another feature, another very nice feature or uh, experimental feature that Node Control provides, which is registry-less image distribution using IPFS. IPFS. Um, so this is a fancy way of saying peer-to-peer -peer image distribution by leveraging IPFS, uh, which is interplanetary file system. And uh, IPFS is essentially a decentralized network protocol designed to store and distribute files on the internet. So that's one of the relevant goals of IPFS, but it's not the primary goals. Um, one of the examples uh, that, that we can think about here is uh, node to node peer image sharing in a KDS cluster. For example, you can pull image on a particular cluster and then you don't need to worry about pulling that same image on different clusters time and time again. You can simply share the image uh, amongst the cluster uh, and the cluster can act as peers, right? So that's one. And then uh, here we can um, sort of like visualize how these differ from the traditional way of pulling images and then like traditionally, the container registry acts as a single source of truth for all the container images. One node pushes the image to the registry and the other, no other node pulls from the registry. So the registry acts as a source of truth for a, for a container image. Using IPFS or peer-to-peer -peer image distribution, on the other hand, uh, essentially avoids or eliminates using a centralized repository or a centralized container image registry. So here, I think, uh, as you can see in the diagram on the right, there is uh, a peer that requires an image, and then uh, other peers can basically, uh, it, it can pull images from uh, neighboring peers. And I'm assuming you would know how P2P works based on a very popular protocol, which enables distributed file sharing system, uh, file sharing on the internet. And then uh, let's, let's quickly see a demo for the same. So I already have a IPFS daemon running. Um, I am gonna, Quickly uh, push an Alpine image to this different tag, let's say. Oops, okay, let me 
find latest alpine test and then if we push this and this is pushed and we can use this cid which is a hash for the uh, container image and we can say nerd control to run this by pulling from uh, ipfs rather than the registry and before that let me quickly I remove the images so that it makes sense. Uh, okay. So we don't have any image and then we run it and there we are. So it doesn't, of course, it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, on, on a single host, but I think you get the idea of how this works. Um, now, there is another fancy feature uh, which is provided by node control, which is debugging Docker files. Now, um, this is provided via a tool called BuildG. And um, node control basically leverages BuildG and then provides uh, Docker file debugging uh, in an interactive fashion. And then you also have the ability to add breakpoints in the Docker file to, for debugging. Um, but it, it's much more fun if you see the demo quickly. So here I have a simple Docker file, uh, which is uh, installing a figlet package uh, in a base Alpine image. And uh, I can just do builder debug dot, and it goes into a debug mode. And what I can do here is I can add a breakpoint and then I can say uh, stop at line number two. And I wanna see, I wanna debug whether things are actually working or not. And then I say continue. And then uh, at the breakpoint, I can run commands. And now here, I can simply check if Figlet was actually ins installed or not. Oh, it does work indeed. And uh, continue. And now I can say run it figlet. It works twice. OK. So that's. Um, doc file debugging in container in not control. This is a fancy feature. Uh, I think it's still uh, experimental and advanced, but I think uh, it makes for a, uh, since it's not meant to be used in production, I don't think you can use it in production. It's more uh, meant as a developer workflow. I think it makes for a nice addition to a, uh, to a developer workflow. Um, then it also provides running containers from encrypted images. It's one of the features for nerd control, and then you can encrypt container images uh, using the command nerd control image encrypt um, in order to protect the confid confidentiality uh, if, if your particular use case so desires. And uh, you can use the commands as shown in the in the slide here. But the idea is to essentially create a, a key pair and then use your public key to encrypt the image and then use your private key to decrypt the image. Um, it uses ImageCrypt or OCI crypt internally uh, for encryption and decryption. And the last is uh, rootless networking using bypass for NetNS. So Slurp for NetNS is uh, the de facto tool to provide network solution for rootless containers um, right now. So every container component right now uses Slurp for NetNS, uh, whether that be Docker, uh, that be Podman, or even Nerd control. control. So far, and uh, the thing about Slurp or not NetNS is that it is slow than a traditional host network um, due to virtualized networking in user space. So, what Nerd Control does is it uses uh, something called bypass for NetNS, uh, which avoids this overhead by tapping sockets as calls and executing them in host host networking namespace. So it's slightly different uh, than your um, uh, minus minus net equals to host, which is to say that just use the host network uh, namespace in the container, but it is uh, almost as fast as that. In fact, it is in some benchmarks, it is shown to be faster than fruitful uh, networking. And then you can run uh, rootless networking as shown in the commands here. I think we're running out of time in order for me to show you a demo, but it's fa fairly straightforward. And uh, with that, I think we can move on to the last section of the session, which is to um, 
say how you can get started with continuity and node control. It's uh, again very uh, straightforward if you're running um, uh, a SUSE system or any uh, Linux distribution, popular Linux distribution for that matter. Uh, you can uh, install the continuity and node control packages, and then you can run the following command, and you should have node control and cont continuity running uh, out of the box. For rootless, uh, there is one other step that is required. This, uh, there is a script that is provided by uh, the continuity folks uh, that you can use to set up rootless, net or rootless uh, containers using node control, which is again, uh, the links are there in the slides. Uh, you, you can take a look at those later on. And uh, with that, I think uh, we can talk about uh, the takeaways. So the idea for this session was for more and more people to try out newer tools. And in this case, uh, it turned out to be continuity and not control. Um, they, they have a host of new features and it is quite a lot of fun to try those features out. For example, lazy pulling is so much fun to uh, uh, use and to understand how it works. And in a similar vein, uh, rootless networking is also fun. Interactive Docker file debugging is uh, a, a nice to have feature when you're writing a lot of Docker files or dealing with a lot of Docker files. And uh, also uh, a lot of diversity in the domain uh, eventually helps further more innovation in future uh, in, in, in the space. So it eventually means more choice for the user and uh, more development and more innovation. And we're already seeing the effects of these because certain features that were started off with Podman, uh, of, sorry, with Node Control are now being ported back to Docker and Podman. As we saw, for example, lazy pulling is one of the features that is uh, making its way into Docker and Podman. And uh, this space is, uh, of course, continuously evolving, uh, but basically with the innovation, both new and older tools. And uh, there's so much to watch out for. So I hope you try out some of the features that we talked about in this session. And then um, if you have any questions, I'll be sitting down in the chat room uh, in order to answer your questions. Thanks a lot for joining the session and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.